Good afternoon. My name is Louise Kennedy. Welcome to Legal Update for Techies. I am going to um, amaze you all by not requiring you to sit in a darkened room and look at a screen. Instead, we're going to have a discussion, hopefully a, a helpful conversation, and we have some handouts, um, and we have extras as well as they'll be available electronically um, after the conference for those who are interested in having a copy. So when I was asked to present at this conference, I was told to identify a couple of issues that I thought would be particularly relevant to this group. Um, and I settled upon two. Um, the first, as you saw in the description of this talk, the first being um, our sort of recent developments in the world of FTC enforcement and endorsements and issues related to um, bloggers and tweet ups in that area with respect to disclaimers and those sorts of things. So that's the, sort of the first issue. I could spend an hour on just that issue, so we're going to try to keep it really brief. And the second issue is going to be a bit about the state, current state of copyright law and how copyright law has gotten really stretched to try to make it work with our current new technologies. And the law is always slow to adapt. Um, so we're going to try to remain a step ahead as far as we can to make sure that we know where the law is going and how we can plan well to be compliant. So first, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a business and technology law attorney here in Greater Boston. I own um, a seven women attorney law firm uh, just north of here, and we specialize primarily in technology law. My background is I spent nine years in-house at IBM, um, where I worked with the hardware group, the software group, the services group, doing a lot of mergers and acquisitions activity of small companies. And my last gig with IBM was just down the street here at Lotus. Um, and I was there when I left uh, to start my own practice. And I love to tell the story that the reason why I left is that we were going through an acquisitions boom, where we were buying, all, or actually, we didn't actually buy, we were looking to buy a bunch of small companies. And many of them failed to meet IBM standards. And I felt really bad for these companies. This was, their, this was their chance to like get their big paycheck after their years of you know, blood, sweat, and tears. And they hadn't done the right things, and so IBM couldn't buy them. And so I realized that there was this unmet need of companies out there that need very sophisticated legal assistance at rates and on a scale um, that they can afford and that can help them grow their business. And maybe if their goal is to be acquired, to have that happen, or whatever it is that their exit plan is. So that's what I do. Uh, I love working with developers. Um, I loved my developers at Lotus. They were awesome. Um, and I like to try to take what I know and help my clients and help their developers be ready for the challenges that come up um, in our current legal environment. So let's turn initially um, to this uh, handout. We're going to talk a little bit about endorsements, a little bit about marketing and advertising. Now, as you may or may not be aware, Advertising of all forms is regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. And they have some pretty basic standards that they use to regulate advertising. They basically want you to know, want to know, that the advertising that's out there in whatever form is truthful and non-deceptive, that you have evidence to back up any claims that you make, and that the advertisements are not unfair. Now, for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to be focusing on the idea of deceptive <coughs> advertising, because that's what comes up mostly in this tech space, uh, where we're trying to figure out, is the tweet, is the blog post, is the uh, affiliate ad deceptive? The FTC gives some very nice, helpful, in English guidelines as to what that means. Deceptive means that an ad is likely to mislead customers acting reasonably, or is uh, omit or includes or omits information that is material that a person would want to know when they're looking at an ad and making a purchase decision. So when we're looking at, for example, a blog post, a blog post needs to comply with both of these. It can't be misleading. And if there's something material that the reader would want to know about that blogger, it needs to be included. And so that's where we came up, where the federal government came up with these FTC guidelines concerning the use of tutorials and endorsements. Now, if you go to Google and you just type this in, the first search result is a nice PDF. It's about 90 pages long. My goal today is to suck that down into a very small kernel that you can take away with you and actually apply um, when you're doing work in this area. 
The FTC guidelines talk about consumer endorsements, celebrity endorsements, expert endorsements, and then the one nearest and dearest to my heart as we're preparing for this presentation is those advertisers who have a material stake in the effect of the ad. So, um, you know, consumer endorsements must reflect typical experience is pretty straightforward. You know, you know all those ads, you know, I lost 50 pounds in, in five weeks. And then you have, you know, experience not typical in like really small font. <laughs> uh, that's what they're getting at. That's their disclosure to try to stay in line with this particular rule. Celebrity endorsements, expert endorsements are pretty straightforward to the extent any of you work with celebrities or experts when you're putting these things together. You can keep those things in mind, but that's not the vast majority of enforcement actions that the FTC has taken recently. In particular, the area where the FTC has focused is on advertisers failing to disclose material connections between a person endorsing a product or a service and the manufacturer or service provider. And there's a number of different ways um, that this can be an issue, obviously, if you're a consumer and you're reading a bunch of reviews, don't you think you'd take more a grain of salt the one that came from the, oh, I don't know, employee of the company that is actually producing the product or service, or the person who's being paid to blog with respect to the product or service? So the FTC has focused in on that as the area of significant emphasis. Now, if you're doing a print ad, it's pretty straightforward, right? You have your print ad, in a newspaper or a magazine, the old-fashioned kind, and you have the disclaimer, and if the font size is not you know, too much different from the font size of the rest of the ad, you know, you're in pretty good shape. But when you get online, it gets a little bit more complicated. How do you do a disclaimer in a tweet? How do you do a disclaimer, an effective disclaimer, in a blog post? Now, the good news is, in August of this year, actually, I think it was in July of this year, no. It was in March, March of this year. Dot com disclosures. How to make effective disclosures in digital advertising. The Federal Trade Commission realized that there was a lot of confusion about how you do effective disclaimers, disclosures, under the FTC law that's been in place for many decades in this new medium. And this is a really, really good and helpful document. Um, what I've done for you is I've included one example from the document on the back of this page. We can talk about this one for a minute because I find this one pretty interesting. There's a bunch about tweets, and we can talk about that as well. But I was a little surprised by the way the FTC came down on this one, and I'd love to get your thoughts on, on, on their opinion about this. So we have an ad, Master Bath, a splash of color. And we've got a blogger writing about how great this paint is. And it's phenomenal, it's great. You can click on this to get it here. Um, just one coat in Canary Sunrise. You can click away to see that. And then you get down to the bottom of the post, and you see, by the way, Paint World gave me the paint to try out, but it's so terrific, I'll buy it myself this time. To me, that sounds like a pretty decent disclosure. But the FTC has ruled this is not sufficient because there's basically two reasons. One is it's way down at the bottom of the post. You have to read the whole thing. And secondly, there are distracting links in between the bottom of the post and where the disclosure appears. Now, we can all dispute whether this is good law, whether this is appropriate use of the FDA's discretion, and that's another story for another day. But this is what the FTC has held up to us as what it is that we need to avoid when we're working in this area. Yes? What can we find in the entire document? Excuse me? Where can we find the entire document? Yep, it's on the FTC website, ftc.gov. And if you just, excuse me? The full name? F, uh, it's just ftc.gov, and it's called dot .com disclosures. There are 21 examples. This is actually the last example that I've provided for you. Some of the examples are not particularly interesting. They're for newspaper, not newspaper, but um, more I don't know, maybe you find them interesting. I, I personally found the most interesting ones to be the blogging ones and the tweeting ones. There's other ones which are just ads that might be used by affiliates, for example, to click through to offers or for even for just information on websites where you're going to order a product and 
there's some disclosure that needs to be made in connection with that product. Say, for example, you're selling diamond earrings. FTC has a rule that says if you use the word carrot and indicate a number of carrots associated with a diamond, a disclosure is necessary. When you're working on about what a carrot is and how actually three quarters of a carrot can be from this grade to this grade and it's a range, it can be anywhere in that range. One, another example of an interesting FTC guideline, but the question is how do you make that work on a web page or in a shopping cart scenario so that there is a way for the purchaser to see that disclosure. Is that uh, jewelry example on, is that one of the examples they use? Yep. Because I know we just did a jewelry website and I know that... Um, can you speak up? I can, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. We just did a jewelry website and I know that the words care were used but not in an advertising. It was just on the page itself. You know, yep. The four C's of diamonds. So right. Whatever. Right. So only if you're selling it. So if you're selling, yep. And there's actually a link to the prop to the FTC guideline in here that requires. There's about 20 different industries that have regulations with regard to advertising, um, and one of them happens to be the jewelry industry. And anytime you use the word carrot, um, so you, they they give examples in here of how on the page where they're just the, where they're describing the product how they do the disclaimer, that's, that I should say disclosure, and then again on the checkout page, how you can get to the disclosure. Um, and so it's a helpful document generally, but there's also some good examples of specific industries that are more regulated than others. Another good example is when you are um, dealing with financial services products. Obviously there's disclosures that are required there as well. How do you make them prominently in a setting where it might be difficult? like on a complex web page? How is it going to render on a mobile device, for example? How is a, a tweet going to take into account that information? And so that's what this document does, and I wanted to walk you through some of the basics of some of the things you'd be thinking about when there's a disclosure that needs to be made. Yes? You mentioned that the FCC would like it if someone put um, their free edit at the end of a blog post. Mm -hmm. What if chronologically and logically that is where it belongs. For example, I blog about world travel and the vegan food and restaurants I find. Every once in a while, a restaurant will give me a free appetizer or a free. Um, every once in a while, a restaurant will give me a free appetizer or a free dessert when I tell them I'm a vegan travel blogger, and I do mention that in my blog post. But if that happens to be the restaurant that I ate at at the end of my day of sightseeing that free item would be mentioned at the end of the post. In that case, is it considered legal and okay? Right, so one of the real issues you want to look at, and that's what we have here under um, number four, is ways that you can address the concerns raised by the FTC. And one of the ways you can do it is through proximity. So when you mention that restaurant, you don't want to go on and on about how good the food was and then at the bottom talk about, oh, and by the way, they gave me a free appetizer. Instead, the better way to do it is to be, oh, and I tried, you know, Joe's famous vegan, you know, parens, whatever. Oh, by the way, they gave me a free appetizer, you know, which didn't affect my review of this restaurant or something. But the idea is it can't be after they've read about how good, you know, the this particular dish was and another particular dish was. So you're looking for proximity. Louise? Yes. So on this example on the back page, yep. the crafties, they aren't even selling anything. And this is illegal? Yep. Yep. So let me tell you a little bit more about that. So here's how the liability flows. As a manufacturer of a product or the purveyor of a service, you are responsible for all of the advertising that happens about your product. So you are responsible as a product manufacturer or service provider to tell anyone that is creating stuff on your, any bloggers, or any people who are putting out advertising on your behalf, that they have to comply with all this. So that's one of the, and that's one of the reasons why I recommend to everyone who works in this area to put agreements in place. Now I know that contracts and agreements are expensive, time-consuming, etc. But a basic template agreement between a blogger and a, a product line, for example, can address many of these issues and, and, and also figure out who is going to be liable. Because yes, the blogger has some liability in this situation, but it's going to be the manufacturer of the product or the service provider who's going to, in the end, get the complaint from the FTC. 
But obviously, if you want to be a reputable blogger who wants to work with large companies, if you want to, I mean, obviously, these are things that you need to be aware of. Yes. So if uh, I have a software download that I'm offering free to anybody that likes me on Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, what's my liability there? I mean, if, if, if what I'm doing is I'm using likes as a way to kind of get the word out. Yep. And I'm saying all you have to do is, is, is like it or, you know, write a comment about it. Mm -hmm. And then you'll get a free <coughs> software yep. download. All right. Uh, so is that yeah. any way unfair or misleading? Are you making any product claims? No, but there's no disclaimer for the people that actually like it or there's no disclaimer uh, about uh, I got this product for free. But are they then going to go and blog about it? Well, they're endorsing it. They're, they're putting thumbs up or they're making a comment about it. Right. So the idea here is it's trying to capture the, um, the paid endorser. So if you're doing this for the purpose of getting people to blog about you, like, please let everybody know, please blog about this, please tell everybody that you like this. I mean, everybody knows that because if you give a thumbs up on Facebook and then you get the software, you did not have a reasonable basis to make a judgment about the software before you gave the thumbs up. So I think they have not addressed that scenario in any of the guidelines yet. I think it's an interesting one, although you do need to be careful when you're using Facebook, Twitter, any of those platforms for those types of purposes, because the terms of use of Facebook actually prohibit some of those types of activities. Um, and so you need to be very clear and read those provisions. There's actually a really big sweepstakes provision in the Facebook terms of service. Um, that covers a lot more than you would expect that it would. Um, so you'll want to take some care when you're doing those sorts of things. Yes? What about like when I'm blogging and I'll write about a favorite book, you know, or I'll write about a product and I'll provide a link to the product on Amazon? Mm -hmm. That's perfectly fine. Well, Are you being paid? I, I will use an affiliate link. Yes. You need to disclose your affiliate link. I read that in some countries it's actually illegal if you write a negative blog post. Like if you say that, um, I read in some countries you yeah. can get sued if you write a blog post, let's say that the restaurant cook was horrible because they can sue and say, well, you destroyed their future business. Is that true in the U.S.? Also? That is not true in the U.S. Um, now, they could, the, the product owner, or I mean, I deal with this with my clients. I have clients who have competitors who hire bloggers to attack his product. And that happens all the time. And so we have a couple different you know, bows in our quiver when it comes to that situation. Um, if the person is in the US, it's much easier because you can't get jurisdiction typically on someone outside of your country. If they have a reputable ISP, it's much easier because you can get stuff taken down. Or a reputable blog provider, you can get it taken down. You also have trademark or copyright lawsuits that are at your, disclo at your disposal if they've misused your trademark or your copyright somehow. Um, you could make a defamation claim, but boy, you're, you're, I mean, those are expensive, and most people, I mean, it's very, very difficult to do, but you don't want to be on the receiving end of a lawsuit like that, because the, the plaintiff is in the driver's seat. If you get sued, you don't have a lot of choices, um, and so obviously, you know, erring on the side of being factual and being, um, and provide, and being clear you're providing opinion is going to go a long way in the U.S. So I, yeah. A smaller blogger or a smaller company has been actually sued for um, yes. unfair. And was it very obvious that they were doing very unbiased reviews? I mean, if you're do if you're receiving free stuff and half the time you say it's awful and the other half the time you say it's good, how is someone going to sue you for being favorable if you're being obviously unbiased? All right. So the, the purpose of this discussion is not really defamation or bias or or those kinds of issues. I mean, the best advice that I can provide, and I'm obviously not providing legal advice to you know 50 people, but the, if, to the extent you're being truthful, that's a hundred percent, a hundred percent defense under the law in the United States if you are being truthful. Now, if you're using their trademark improperly or you're using like a screenshot, which would be copyrighted, then you've got other issues. Um, but what we're getting at here is the idea that okay, I'll give you an example of a recent enforcement action, which I think will be helpful. So Nordstrom, everyone knows and loves Nordstrom, Nordstrom Rack, decided they want to attract a lot of people to a particular event. 
So they sent the word out into the Twitter sphere that certain influencers who came to the event and tweeted about it would get $50 gift cards. But they didn't give any instructions to those bloggers as to whether or not they needed to disclose this in these positive tweets and positive blog posts that they were going to be getting. As a result, only a very small percentage of the bloggers or tweeters actually said, yes, and I'm going to get some swag from Nordstrom. So the FTC did an intensive investigation of Nordstrom. And obviously, Nordstrom has good lawyers. They immediately, like, hopped to. They updated all their policies. They now have agreements they put in place with people that they're going to be giving stuff to in exchange for, for blogs. Um, and they, had, they did a number of things during the course of the investigation that caused the FTC not to actually go forward and require them to enter into a consent decree. Now, other companies have not fared quite so well, either through ignorance or just, you know, deciding that they were right and the world was wrong. There's an example out there of a, excuse me, a guitar company, a guitar um, instruction company that did videos and uh, downloads, we could download video to learn how to play the guitar. And they had lots of affiliates who were out doing all kinds of crazy things, talking about how great this guitar lesson offering was, how fantastic it is, giving examples of how well they've done, you know, from the time they got it until now, and, and basically with no disclosure at all of the fact that they were being compensated by this company. Um, as a result, the company was investigated by the FTC. Uh, they were fined $250 million, some ridiculously huge sum. Um, but, and I look at the money and I'm like, you know, the money's the money. I mean, these guys, there's only so much money they have, right? So the bigger problem is that there are restrictions put on both executives about any businesses they go into for the next 20 years. Anybody that works with them, they have to put in place certain government approved provisions. They have to rent, take their top 50 affiliates every month and look at everything that they do and randomly select 50 additional affiliates to randomly test. To me, that's, that's the teeth of the enforcement action. The money, uh, the money. But the fact that you can't run your business the way you want to. And needless to say, you wouldn't have wanted to be in that affiliate pool um, because it was going to just become so much harder to do what you were doing. And the company was obviously going to have a lot of difficulty. So the FTC targets the company, typically. Um, but obviously, it's, it's, not a, it's not a great story to be one of the affiliates that's being investigated either. Yeah, uh, hi. I was going to ask you a question before you brought up the Nordstrom's example. That, um, we have a small company. We want to reach out to um, a lot of bloggers in the design community who buy products from us and have a contest where we will offer you know so much of our product to like the winning design. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you brought up the Nordstrom example. So I'm just you know hadn't really occurred to me that as part of our rules we should build into that, that whoever wins should be um, disclosing in anything they tweet or, or post about in their own blogs that they're getting merchandise for free from us. Yeah, I mean, in that scenario, I think the main consideration also is going to be sweepstakes law, which is very, very complicated. Um, the number one issue is what is the value of the prize that you're giving? And is it over five thousand dollars because if it is then there's going to be bonding requirements in florida and new york and other states there's also the states that don't allow you to, to run sweepstakes even ones that are based on skill and talent i've done both kinds with clients where we put together um, sweepstakes or contest rules where it's purely random versus there's actually a skill involved and the law is all over the map the law is different in almost every state so it's the kind of thing that you have to be very careful about. You want to also limit it to U.S. only to the extent that you can because it's it gets completely out of hand when it gets global. Even big companies struggle to get those legal terms and conditions right. What did this all hear about? I mean, how is a small business owner, like a jewelry store, for example, supposed to know that they were supposed to do, you know, when they're having their website built? Full disclosure. Yep. Like, when did it all come about? So um, the basic FTC guidelines um, have been around for decades that require you to do certain disclosures in certain industries. I can't tell you how long the jewelry one's been around. I actually learned about it in the context of reading this document. I've never worked with a jewelry store, so I would have no way of knowing it. But 
the idea is if you work in an industry, you have an attorney that is going to know the things that impact your industry or at least do the research to find out what it is. I mean, I know when I represent a client in a new industry, one of the first things you do is you figure out what regulatory <coughs> requirements does my client have in this industry. And it's a, usually a pretty simple re review. Not, there aren't tons of industries that are regulated. But, you know, for example, um, you know, any products that are geared toward children under the age of three have very specific requirements. We know that. We know what they are. We can tell our clients what they are, and they can follow them or not at their peril. Um, but that's, that's, that's the short answer. But then the agency um, would be responsible. Are we no. Responsible? Well, it depends on what your contract says with your customer. Okay. And that's another reason. I, I always bring it back to that for a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, I think that the responsibility for dealing with industry-specific regs should absolutely be with the customer. And the contract should be drafted to make that abundantly clear. Um, and I also have found that when you don't have a contract in place with your web designer, for example, it can cause you, as a business owner, tons of problems down the road. When you go to sell your company, if you don't have a clear path to the rights that you have in and to everything that comprises your website, you're screwed. Um, you're required when you sell your company most often to make all kinds of reps and warranties about what you own and what you don't own, all the assets of your company. And your website's a pretty major asset. So we always recommend to business owners, even if it's already been done, even if it's far in the past, get something in place with your web designer so that it's clear that you have the right to transfer that to an acquirer. Yeah, there is a yeah. In place. yeah but yeah, you don't know what it says. I mean, you'd have to review it and make sure it says what you want it to say. I practice law. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I practice law, and I'm glad to see you here because all small business owners really need to understand and begin to understand that we utilize professionals like an accountant and insurance brokers and lawyers as a tool. That's all. It's an asset. It's a resource to bring within your reach. Unfortunately, if you wait for it to happen, it will happen. I read a while back that with the FTC, and, and, and Louise, I'd like to get your opinion on this, the FTC regulations require with affiliate sites that they post that they're being paid at the top of the website and, and clearly defined font um, in, in a, 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 a color which is not different. Um, so, you know, I think if you learn what it is, you could utilize it to your advantage right. and not hide out. If you try and hide out, you're going to get caught. Yeah, and the good news is it's not quite that detailed. So I took from this dot-com disclosures the most recent guidance from the FTC on some of the things you should be thinking about when you have to make a disclosure on a website or anywhere, anywhere online that you, would be, that you would be making a disclosure. And it's all really common sense. There's really nothing that you're like, whoa, that's a huge surprise. It proximity. Put the disclosure near the uh, the claim that needs that requires a disclosure, or avoid having to scroll all the way down, or get to another column. Say if you're using a mobile device, that can be tricky to actually get to the disclosure. So it's very very straightforward, um, but it does require a little bit of effort and a little bit of becoming familiar with with how these things, you know, how you can have a blog that is truly compliant with FTC guidelines. I would like to move on to the second topic. I will take more questions about this after, um, because I promised Reiko that I would cover both things, and I'm going to get in big trouble if I don't. So um, let me just let you know that these are available online, both the dot-com disclosures as well as the, the, um, the FTC um, enforcement guidelines for endorsements and testimonials. I recommend that you read them. They're not written like statutes. They're written for regular people. They're written not, you don't have to have a law degree to understand these documents. I actually find them pretty interesting. I find the examples fascinating. I, I really enjoyed reading the various examples because they seem like real life and they're real situations you can imagine. So I thought that was going to be helpful. Now, um, uh, our bovine assistant is passing out the, um, my, my second handout. And I just wanted to touch briefly on copyright, because I know there's a lot of developers present at this conference, and this is the topic that is most near and dear to my heart, which is how do you properly protect your own copyright 
And how do you properly use the copyrighted materials of others? And I deal with this every single day um, in many, many different contexts. And I just wanted to put up front that, so you're aware, that the federal government right now is, they're actually having another meeting on October 30th. They're really trying to figure this out and get it right so that we have a balance between the protection of copyrights and avoiding piracy and avoiding infringement, but then also letting the internet be what it does best, which is an open and free area where people can exchange ideas and, and create. And so that's why I put that down there. This quote is from the a former chair of the, of, the, um, of the Department of Commerce, which is handling this issue. And I, I think it's important to know that that's, sort of, that's, that's where we start. Um, so recently, there was a, what they call a green paper, Not can't tell you I'm sure why that's the title, um, put out by the Department of Commerce, maybe because they only did it electronically, I have no idea, um, called Copyright Policy, Creativity, and Innovation in the Digital Economy. Um, this QR code will bring you there. It is a really cool document, although you wouldn't guess it by the cover. Looks really like super wicked boring. Um, but what it is, is a discussion of what they've determined to be the five top issues in copyright law right now. So I don't know, I would imagine everyone here owns, whether or not they know it, some form of copyright in something. Because all the copyright is, whether or not you register it with the federal government, is some idea or creation fixed in a permanent medium, a blog. A blog is a great example. A website is a great example. A this, arguably, is, is, yeah, sure, anything, you, your notes, your grocery list, that is your copyright. Um, and so the question is, what are these hot issues? What I've done is I've outlined them for you, and if any of these are things that are really relevant to what you do, I highly, highly recommend that you go and take a look at this document. Really interesting issues with streaming of music going on right now. We have several clients who want to have music on their websites. How do you get lawfully access to music for your website. It's a very tricky legal issue right now. The government recognizes that. They're addressing it. You know, Spotify versus going direct to BMI and the publishers and paying direct license and royalty fees and how that will play out. Um, I have a client who runs a website in the wedding industry and it's a very big thing to have music on your wedding website. How do you do that as a small business person without getting yourself on the recipient of a cease and desist letter from one of these companies. We, we had a YouTube video that was rejected because uh, we had a, a, a YouTube video that was rejected because we actually had uh, paid for the rights to the music, but somehow that wasn't transmitted to YouTube, and uh, they they just take it down automatically. Yep, and then it's the burden is on you to prove that you have the rights to use it. And it's interesting because not all rights are created equal. You know, just because you have a license to use it for your individual use doesn't mean that you can broadcast it to the world. Those are two completely different licenses, two completely different scopes of license. So if you have a CD, the old-fashioned kind, that you put in the slot in your car, you can't just up that, load that onto a website. You have a license to use that CD for your personal use. Actually, hyper-technically, if you had a big party and there were 50 people there, you probably couldn't play that CD legally, especially if you had people pay to attend this event. So that's a very interesting area of the law that is really developing, and they're giving it some very, very thoughtful consideration. And I just wanted to raise these issues and raise your awareness about them. Um, remixes are a big issue. And online licensing. Now, one area of online licensing that is near and dear to my heart is when you go to a site like iStock or any of those related logo, um, you know, uh, image websites. And if you have one takeaway from this, any of you who use those sites, which I have seen a lot of nodding heads, so I'm assuming it's several of you, is they are not created equal. These sites are absolutely not created equal. Their terms and conditions are radically different across them. Some of these sites offer you the right to use this image, even if you pay for it, as is. No warranties, no guarantees, no promises. If you get sued for the use of this image, you are on your own. Now there's a handful of sites that will give you a limited indemnity, which means if the real rights holder comes and sues you for using the image, they'll identify you. And iStock Photo by Getty is actually one of those. And they will give you 
lo and behold, $10,000 to defend that lawsuit. Now, I hate to break it to you, but $10,000 will barely, barely get you in the door with the litigator that you will need to hire to defend this suit. So that's something to keep in mind. iStock Photo does offer, however, something called, and I'm not a chill for them, I have no connection to them, an enhanced license. It can cost anywhere from seven to 12 to $20, and it gives you a much more substantial indemnity limit. So if you got sued, they would indemnify you to the tune of fifty or $100,000, which probably would cover most of your legal costs. So in my estimation, it usually makes sense if you're offered an enhanced license to take it. Also, make sure you understand the scope of the license that you've, that you've created. Just because you have bought a license doesn't mean you can put it on t-shirts and on the book cover and in, on your blog and in a dozen different ways. There's always restrictions on the ways that you can use those things. Now, copyright and content, this is my other like big, big pet peeve in this world. How many people have seen this on websites? Copyright, 2013, mywebsite.com. See that all the time, right? Websites can't own trademarks or copyrights or any intellectual property rights. It is owned by your company or it is owned by you in your personal capacity. Your website cannot own any intellectual property. So I see that day in and day out and I'm like, it's ridiculous. It's worse than nothing on the bottom of your website. We recommend, typically, something along the lines of what we've create, provided here. And we actually will let you Create your own, I'd be happy to check anyone's work, of what your copyright statement should say on the copyrighted materials you create, whether it's your blog, your website, your flyer, whatever it might be. Regarding the Creative Commons copyright, yep. how effective do you find those to be for der particularly the no derivations require attribute? Uh, portion of it. Yeah, I mean, so we could talk all day about all the various licenses that are out there. I mean, in Creative Commons, um, I always have to take a step back and ask, what exactly are you using this for? And I have different advice typically based on what the usage is going to be. If you're going to use it and include it in a downloadable software product where you have no ability to pull it back once it's out there, no. I don't recommend the use of those materials because I think it's just simply too risky. If it's something like just appears just appears on your website, where you could take it down in a flash, then obviously the risk is substantially less. And that's you know that's just across the board with respect to all these licenses. Um, and so I recommend that everybody have their own personal copyright statement that they can carry around in their back pocket and slap onto whatever awesome things you create, and know that it's done properly. It's going to be your name, your full legal name or the name of your company, plus your company identifier. I like to see LLCs and inks. I like to know that you actually, if you are incorporated, you want to put that out there um, because it's going to protect you in the long run. Now, on the back, this might only apply to some of you, but it's a very hot issue for me and my developers. Notices.txt files. Anybody familiar with these? Any developers in the room? So I'll keep my comments very brief. The idea being, if you are incorporated, third-party copyrighted materials into your software, you need to always recognize those copyrights and follow the licenses, but also give attribution in a notices.txt file. And this is one of the things that we help clients with, and it really, really can help protect you from liability from third-party code providers. Real quick, so we are yep. out of time, you know, close out of time. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.